And I'll tell you what, nothing makes you get your taxes done faster than wanting to buy a property. Everybody's different. Everyone's on a different journey, but the majority of us don't have 500,000 sitting in the bank. I really think it's important for folks to explore the conventional options, those 10 and 15% down loans. And the beautiful part is, is that when it comes to conventional lending, we don't care about the AGI. Welcome back, everyone, to the Learn Like a CPA show. We are live in Nashville for the STR Wealth Conference, and we are excited because the conference sort of begins today, goes uh, through Wednesday slash Thursday, and we are super, super excited to be here, the number one short-term rental wealth conference, and I have the number one short-term rental lender with me, Parker, from Movement Mortgage. How are you? Thanks, doing great. How are you doing? I'm amazing, and you will be speaking, is it on Wednesday? Wednesday at okay. 2.15. And what, what, what's going to be the topic of your presentation? Like, what, what do you want to focus in on? Yeah, so during the presentation, I kind of want to share with uh, folks our journey and mm. how we grew our portfolio to 12 in five years. And then also give them some tips and tricks when it comes to lending and how that can really be a tool for them to achieve their short-term rental goal. Mm. So you said 12 in five years, but what about the 10 conventional loan limit? Oh, that's a very good question. I have a spouse, so uh, we've got 10 under me and we've got a couple. And so how important is that? Because I know when people when people get started and they're not educated, sometimes they're rushed to make decisions. Sure. So one of the things that they do is they probably put both spouses on the loan. So how does that work in terms of, because from my understanding, if you put both spouses on the loan, then the debt counts to both of them versus just one. Like how does that, how does that work? Yeah, that's true. Um, the good news is if they kind of do that in the beginning, starting out, um, maybe because they need to, because sometimes that is necessary to mm -hmm. use. To qualify. To qualify, right. Yeah. So a lot of time, you know, so whether it was just a mistake they didn't know or a, ne a necessity, you know, usually getting to those, those 10 finance properties takes a little while. Mm -hmm. So you've got some time later down the road to refinance out of one person's name and into another um, you know, you buy a property, there's a good chance three or four years down the road, you may be able to do a cash out refi to tap into some equity, mm -hmm. or you may be selling that to 1031 into a bigger mm -hmm. property. And so there's always a chance to correct that. But when you do, when you do 12 and five years and let's, I mean, cause you and I didn't come and have just a million dollars to spend, right? Like right. when you do 12 and five years, you almost have to be very strategic with how quickly do you get there? What year do you buy? So like, tell us a little bit about how that path was. Like your first year, how many did you buy? Three. Three the first year. Yeah. So did that just blow your DTI out of the water the first year? Yes, for a few okay. months until we got our taxes done. Mm. Um, so there's two aspects to think about as you're growing that are very important. One, of course, is DTI. The other is capital. So not everybody has a ton, everybody's different. Everyone's on a different journey, but the majority of us don't have, mm -hmm. you know, 500,000 sitting in the bank just to, to shed out. So we had to be really careful about the products we use and the down payments that were required. And then also, of course, that debt to income ratio. And so, and this is why, and I'm actually talking about this on, on Wednesday, but this is why I really encourage people not to get sucked into the, we should, or we have to do a 20% down DSCR mm -hmm. loan. I really think it's important for folks to mm -hmm. explore the conventional options, those 10 and 15% um, down loans. Mm -hmm. DSCRs are great, they're, they're not bad loan products. They have their time and, and their place, but I think especially depending on those goals and how quickly they wanna grow, uh, those 10 and 15% down products are uh, instrumental. Yeah, and so you said one thing there, you said the two, two important things, DTI and capital. I always say debt to income and liquidity. Okay. So I, I used to say the number one most important thing for real estate investors is to protect their debt to income. But then I started at what I started noticing, um, cause we'll onboard anywhere between 30 to 30 ish clients a month into tax strategy and consulting. And what I noticed a lot lately is I deal with a lot of investors you know, anywhere from 1.5 to $3 million net worth, let's say, or a million to $3 million net worth. And sometimes there's people, if I, if they, if I told them go write a $30,000 check tomorrow, they couldn't do it because all their net worth, all their money is tied up either in 401ks or real estate and they don't, they're not liquid enough. And so 
what happens if one spouse loses their job and they need a lot of money and the, the rentals are not paying for or not enough to cover that, like they're going to have to end up selling one of those properties. So one of the things we try to do is assess the risk of somebody not having capital and recommend that they shift some of their portfolio, not just only from real estate, but to kind of have either money in mutual funds or just kind of high yield savings. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's great, especially to look out for and protect their um, their well-being. I think that's important. Yeah, because a lot of times, especially now, a lot of people go straight from W2 to real estate. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I'm starting to teach is the overall flow of money, where it's making money at your W2, parking it into an investment account, let it earn and grow interest, tax efficient, and then moving it to real estate. A lot of people just go W2 straight to real estate. Right. Um, so the, the guidelines for what adds to your income, right? We talk about that. And so you said that after you have to file one tax return. To use any of that short-term rental income. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think a lot of folks just because as I talk to clients on a daily basis, I get this quite a bit. They feel like their AGI isn't going to be sufficient because they wrote off so much. Or maybe one spouse is self-employed, the other W two, but the one spouse's self-employment was a loss and then created a lower AGI. And mm-hmm. the beautiful part is, is that when it comes to conventional lending, even jumbos, we don't care about the AGI. We don't even look at that number. So if one spouse took a loss on a business they own and the other has decent W-2 income, we could just take the one spouse that has W-2 income, qualify the qualify them really? for the loan and forget about we don't care about the losses. Oh, wow. Yeah. And actually on that note, let's say you have W-2 and you have a business. Mm-hmm. And let's say the business took a loss. Maybe first you're opening the business, you took a $50,000 loss and maybe your W-2 income is 150. Well, if we only use the W-2 income to qualify, we don't even have to worry about that loss either. They don't net out? No. Wow. Mm-mm. No. So in that, in that situation with the two spouses, if they're both on a loan, do they have to include both their income? Or in that case, you would just leave off the spouse that had the loss? Correct. Yeah, if if mm. for some reason they both wanted to be on the loan, we could still just use the one spouse's W-2 income and not consider the self-employment or the loss for the mm. other at that point. So talk about the timing of when you buy a property versus when you file that, that first tax return and how important that is. Yeah, so let's say if you buy a property in August of this mm-hmm. year, um, I would say definitely do your best to, to get that up and, and running and generating some revenue. And then if you get your taxes filed by February, March, or the deadline in April that next year, um, we could take the revenue that was generated. We'll do a calculation based on August through the end of the year. So whatever that turns out to be, we would divide it by is that five months? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the biggest misconception is that you need to have a year's of income, like a full year of, or even two years sometimes of tax returns. But you're saying it only needs to be, it could be as short as three months, two months? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it gets a little tricky. It's hard to convince underwriting when we get into like, you know, I had it two weeks out of the year. Mm. <laughs> we, we try not to push the envelope that far. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you've got two, three months on there, Sometimes we can squeeze by on 30 days. Um, So explain a little bit more about the actual calculation of, like if I have a rental property and let's say it's making money, how much of that is going to help me count towards my next property I want to buy? So it depends on how how it's reflected on your tax return and the categories of expenses that you claim. Mm -hmm. So um, depreciation, for example, I also get a lot of people that are a little bit panicked about taking so much depreciation and thinking that that's going to have a negative impact. Um, But the reality of that is... Real quick, guys, if you could think about how you found this podcast, maybe it was on Facebook, Instagram, maybe somebody shared it with you. I don't run ads for the show or have sponsorships, so the only way this grows is through word of mouth. If this was valuable for you in any way, the only ask that I can make is that you share it with somebody else. Pass it on to the next person whose investing journey or business can be changed by listening to the show. Much love, guys, and let's get into the episode. The reality of that is... When you do a cost seg and have that depreciation, we're going to add every penny of that back in. Mm-hmm. So that's a great category to write off from a lending perspective because 
we can add that all back into the equation. So we'll add back the um, depreciation, taxes, insurance, and mortgage interest that are mm. reflected there. And I learned from you also HOA fees. And HOA dues, yeah. yes. Yes, they just mm. have to be specified that they're HOA dues on there. So that that's so, it's so important to know is because you can literally have cash flow that hits your bank account like uh, from these properties and you turn around and tell the government that you had a loss, but then you can also use that loss, add back the loss for the next property. So it's like, it's not even like having your cake and eating it too. It's, it's like having the whole buffet. Yeah. Like you can make cash flow. It doesn't get taxed. You lose a, use a loss against your income and then you can add the loss back to your AGI. Yeah. Let me ask you something. So when you bought the first, what year was it when you bought your first, the three? 2018. 2018. Mm -hmm. Did you do cost seg in 2018? Did you know about it? We didn't know about it. Oh, shit. Okay. No, no, we didn't start when doing it. did you find out? Gosh, see, this is 24. We probably didn't really know about it till maybe the end of 21. Wow. 22, yeah. And then now we've used it as a tool, mm -hmm. you know, for a couple of years. But yeah, I was thinking about, and, you know, I think initially too, when I first heard about it, was there ever something where it had to be reflected on Schedule C or at least a lot of CPAs? That was a lot of like really bad um, continuing education around um, just short-term rentals in general. Okay. Like they had conferences with hundreds of CPAs and, and accountants and they taught them to put it on Schedule C. Okay. That's what, that's what happened. Okay. Right? Yeah, because I had clients who had been claiming their rental income on Schedule E, switched to Schedule C specifically for the bonus depreciation because they were told they had to. So mm. yeah, another reason why having a great CPA like you can really help with. It, it could also be a software thing too. Um, not that you have to override it, but traditionally to take a loss from Schedule E to go against your, your active, you have to be a real estate pro. So a lot of these, a lot, actually a lot of tax softwares aren't built to use a short-term rental loss against your W-2. So that's why I think some people have to put it on C. Interesting. Like I've, I've consulted with a few other CPAs that asked me questions about it. And then I realized that they're putting it on C. Okay. And I'm like, that's, that's not the way to do it. Because at the end of the day, it's still the same net tax effect. But when you put it on C and it's a loss, it's a lot different than putting it on E as a loss. But then when it does make income, you need two years of the Schedule C, right? Correct. Or at least a full 12 months. So mm -hmm. the, the negative pieces to showing rental income on Schedule C are that... We can usually get away if, with one year if there's a full year, uh, but we can't add back all the categories. We can only add back depreciation, so we can't add back taxes, insurance, mortgage interest, and we have to divide that by a full 12 months instead of months it was in service. You know, we actually went, I had one of our um, VP of underwriting ask Fannie Mae, well, we know that this income on the Schedule C is rental income. Here's the, the evidence. Um, can we count this like we would Schedule E? And Fannie Mae's answer basically was, should have put it on Schedule E? Why'd they put mm. it on Schedule C? So they had to amend their tax return? Yeah, they did, mm. so that we could use it. So uh, first year you bought three, then then what? So that was 2018. So we mm. bought our, we closed on our first one, Feb or January of 2018. Um, and then I always tell people, I know from experience that these things are addicting. You're You're going to buy your first one, and then you're going to want another one because typically they kick off pretty strong in the, in the beginning. So sure enough, so that one we did a 10% down second home loan. And, um, and then by the end of the year, we had two more. We bought two that fall. Um, and those we did 15% down investment. So how does that work? Because sometimes with the 10% down secondary home, you can't have one in the same area. Or like, how does that work? Yeah, you can't have, well, you can't have more than one in the same market because it doesn't make sense that you would have more than. I can't do three 10% downs in the Smokies. Correct. Okay. Yeah, exactly. But you could do a 10% and a 15%? Because the 15% is an investment loan, Investment. Right? Yeah. It's all about occupancy intention. Yeah. Um, you know, and, it, and, and that's where the second homes come into play with a lot of these short-term rentals is that you're purchase, most people are purchasing in areas that they intend to actually go and visit and enjoy themselves and then rent it the rest of the year to make a great profit. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think a big mistake a lot of hosts make is that, or a lot of investors make is that 
when they go talk to lenders, they normally try to just find the lowest rate. Oh yeah. But what about like screw absolutely screwing up your DTI by like two 10% down loans versus a 10% and a 15% investment loan. A lot of people ha- have blind sides, like blind spots. They, they have one specific question and they think once they get the answer to that, it's, it's, that's it. But then there's so much that people don't know about, especially debt, to, like debt to income. Right. Oh yeah. Well, and if you talk, so a lot of loan originators don't know these specific guidelines with second home and investment occupancy because yeah well i mean to their in their defense for on a day-to-day basis most loan originators are financing primary Mm. homes they're they're you know and they may occasionally do a second home or investment but that's not their world so that's why i think it's always important and i think it's off to your point it's often overlooked the importance of having a relationship with a lender who is in the business themselves, who understands it, and who really knows those guidelines in and out. Because a lot of times I find myself teaching underwriters that mm. don't know. So it's really important in order to maximize your, um, your lendability, your bankability, and to get in as quickly and with the least amount of capital as possible. So yeah. I know you asked, so that was our first um, our first year, and then we didn't buy anything that next year. But then early 2020, we actually found um, where we live now, and we have mm. rentals in Townsend. We have a little compound there. And so what was interesting about that is that um, it had been listed. So it's six houses on 18 acres, 700 feet of river frontage in Townsend, Tennessee. Coolest compound. and. Um, they just separated it into four different parcels. So it was great for us. So then what we were able to do, so we bought our primary home for 5% down, um, two of the other parcels at 15% down. And then the third one was a little tricky. Um, we had to go, it was like a five bedroom lodge and two little ones. So at that moment in time, we had to go commercial. So it was 20% down. So you just piecemealed that whole thing together. Yeah, mm. yeah. But at the end of the day, instead of doing 20% down on everything, that would have been, so the whole thing was 2.2, so that would have been 440. Yeah. Um, the way we structured the down payments, we were only out of pocket 305,000 wow. on those, so that's big. So one of the things you talk about is like the path to 10 properties. So you have 12, so yeah. maybe a little change there, but explain the path to 10, kind of walk an investor through, how do they go from their first property all the way up to 10? And do they need 10? Well, you know, that's a great question. So I figured 10 is 10 is a solid number to aim for, mm. and everybody has different goals. So some folks out there, some, you know, medical professionals or higher W-2 earners, some are just buying for the um, tax advantage every year, you know, plus they get to make cash flow. Others have the goal of really replacing their W-2. They, they want to leave, and I've had several clients uh, able to quit their W-2. Mm-hmm. So 10, I figured, was a good round number. Um, not everybody can jump in to get those super properties or, you know, the $1.5, $2 million properties where you could maybe have four instead of 10 to achieve the same goal. Um, so, yeah, so that's why I said 10. 10 is a great round number for people to aim for. Um, and it's not too difficult to get to. So, you know, some people may do one a year. Others may do, you know, two or three in a year. Mm. Um, but my goal is to to sit down and to really help them kind of map that out so they have a clearer vision. So you you scaled it from you bought the fir- the first three, mm-hmm. use the cash flow plus you guys were still working at the time like W two. So then yep. you use the cash flow from the W two plus the short term rental to boost your borrowing power. Correct. To then go into the next ones. Okay, can you? How did that look? Like, walk me through that. In terms of debt to income yeah. ratio? Uh, yeah. So in 2018, we bought those properties. Two of them we had closed towards the end of the year. Um, so we didn't have, I mean, we showed some income on those mm. returns, but it wasn't a lot. 
Um, so by the time that we... Hey guys, just wanted to interrupt the podcast today to let you know about my Facebook group, Tax Strategies for Real Estate Investors. We have over 6,300 real estate investors in the community actively engaging every single day. You're gonna learn all my top tips, you're gonna get to network with other professionals, and you're gonna get to see all the past recordings and all the past posts in that Facebook group. So make sure you join today. It's gonna be linked in the podcast below. And now back to the show. So by the time that we purchased the big property in early 2020, uh, we did get our taxes done. And I'll tell you what, nothing makes you get your taxes done faster than wanting to buy a property. Yep. <laughs> yes. Um, so we got our taxes done and then we're able to use the income showing for those three properties that we owned mm -hmm. to offset um, our debt income ratio. And then, well, and here's the other thing too, on when we purchased those all together, um, the two 15% down parcels that we bought, we could also use projected rental oh, income on. Yeah. So not, and I kind of refer to that as a hybrid because I think a lot of people forget. They'll think of that 10% second home and then they jump to the DSCR. But they There's forget. There's one in the middle. They forget about that. So that 15% that um, they take projected long-term rents or short-term for that one. Depends on the market and the okay. appraiser. And the smoky is probably short term. Yeah, there yeah. there you can't even get mm -hmm. long term rents. <laughs> so back to the cuz it sounds like your like when you file your tax returns are very important cuz if you if you bought a property let's say January or February and you completely screwed up your debt to income like you're not only are you waiting a year right. to file the return but really probably like 16 17 months before you can get another loan because you need to file by April and then have a tax return. So, and then not to mention if you're self-employed, you, so I guess we're doing a webinar soon, right? Yeah. On how you can use your tax returns to help you qualify for more loans. What is another topic that, so aside from debt, so we talked about debt to income, we talked about how do they actually calculate, we talked about accelerated depreciation. And then to wrap the path to 10 up, did you use some of the equity in the properties to buy more property or did you sell properties? Cause I don't think you sold anything, did you? We ha actually have. Okay. Um, so that f the first year we used savings and we did a 401k loan. Um, mm. So we, we didn't take it out, but we did borrow against it. Um, and then for that, when we bought the big set of properties that we sold, we had a primary home that we were doing long-term rental back in Texas that we sold. So we did use that. Um, and then also, I think, no, that's not when we sold our Colorado home. But um, so we use that 401k loan again and savings when we purchased that big property. Um, and then scaling from that point on, then we actually did, we did a HELOC on one property, we cash out refi on another. And I sold two, and then we did a 1031 mm -hmm. into. Um, so you just, you've done just about everything. Yeah, we've done it all. Good. Yeah. So. Where can listeners of the show uh, find you? So we just launched our website. It's, oh, yeah, excited! Um, and, and it's live. It's, it's ready live. To go. It's ready. Yeah, it's on. So that it's kind of a mouthful, I know. Um, but it's wealthbuildersmortgagegroup.com. Okay. So wealthbuildersmortgagegroup.com. Uh, we're still with movement, so we're. I'm just. We've kind of created a separate group. Yeah, we're branding. We've created a separate group powered by movement. Um, and I'm really focused on continuing to develop and provide more resources for our investor client. Yeah. I think there's a lot of not misinformation, but people just are not aware of it at all. Right. Of what are their options? So thanks okay. so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.